Forensic artist Richard Neve has helped the police solve murder cases by reconstructing faces from skulls. In the hope of discovering more about the first Europeans, we've asked him to reconstruct the face of the Wasser skull. So this is Wasser. This is Wasser. There we are. It's wonderful to see him or her. We're not quite sure, are we? No. Fleshed no. out. Touch androgynous, maybe, this one. It's quite strange, actually, because this doesn't particularly look like a... European or African or Asian, it looks sort of almost quite generic, but then I suppose that's what you'd expect from one of the earliest Europeans. You look at this and you can think to yourself, it could go either way. It's, it's almost as though it's, it's a face in flux. It's got features which could go in any direction. It could become Negroid, it could, could become Southeast Asian, it could become European. There's the potential for all those different directions, and that's what I find so exciting about it. Yes. In fact, it's very likely that these earliest of Europeans were quite dark-skinned, much, much darker-skinned than we think of Europeans being today. Yes. Because yes. at the end of the day, you know, they're, they're only just arriving in Europe. They're coming from much more tropical places. Yeah. So I think, you know, we're, we may be looking at something which we're, is actually quite life -like We're not here. too far from... No. No. I've been really excited to see what this face would end up looking like and I do feel as though I am getting much closer to our ancestors. Wait, no, one, two, three, four. I want to start my story in Germany in 1877, the mathematician named George Cantor. And Cantor decided he was going to take a line and erase the middle third of the line and then take those two resulting lines and bring them back into the same process, a recursive process. So he starts out with one line and then two and then four and then 16 and so on. And if he does this an infinite number of times, which you can do in mathematics, he ends up with an infinite number of lines, each of which has an infinite number of points in it. So he realized he had a set whose number of elements was larger than infinity. And this blew his mind, literally. He checked in the sanitarium. And other mathematicians did the same sort of thing. Uh, Swedish mathematician von Koch decided that instead of subtracting lines, he would add them. So they consigned these curves to the back of the math books. They said, these are pathological curves, and we don't have to discuss them. <laughs> and that worked for 100 years. And then in 1977, Benoit Mandelbrot, a French mathematician, realized that if you do computer graphics and use the, these shapes he called fractals, you get the shapes of nature. You get uh, the human lungs, you get acacia trees, you get ferns, you get these beautiful natural forms. If you um, take your, your, your thumb and your index finger and look right where they meet, go ahead and do that now, and, and relax your, your, your hand, you'll see a crinkle, and then a wrinkle within the crinkle, and a crinkle within the wrinkle within, right? Your body is covered with fractals. The mathematicians who were saying these are pathologically useless shapes, they were breathing those words with fractal lungs. Now, in the 1980s, I happened to notice that uh, if you look at an aerial photograph of an African village, you see fractals. But when I got there, um, I got to the, 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 this palace of the chief, uh, and my French is not very good. I said something like, I'm a mathematician, and I would like to stand on your roof. Um, but he was really cool about it. He took me up there, and we talked about fractals. And, and he said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we know a rectangle within a rectangle within a rectangle. We know all about that. And it turns out the royal insignia has a rectangle within a rectangle within a rectangle. And the path through that palace is actually this, this spiral here. And as you go through the, the paths, you have to get more and more polite. So they're mapping the social scaling onto the geometric scale. It's a conscious uh, pattern. It is, it is not unconscious like a, a termite mound fractal. This is in the Mandara Mountains near the Nigerian border in, in Cameroon, Mukulek. I, I saw this diagram drawn by a French um, architect and I thought, wow, what a beautiful fractal. Now, you might ask yourself three questions at this point. Aren't these scaling patterns just universal to all 
indigenous architecture. And that was actually my original hypothesis. When I first saw those African fractals, I thought, wow, so, so any indigenous group that doesn't have a state society that's in a hierarchy must have a kind of bottom-up architecture. But that turns out not to be true. I started collecting aerial photographs of um, Native American, South Pacific architecture. Only the African ones were, were fractal. Uh, second, you might ask, well, Dr. Eglash, aren't you ignoring the diversity of African cultures? Uh, and, and three times the answer is no. Uh, first of all, I agree with uh, Mudimbe's wonderful book, The Invention of Africa, that Africa is, is an artificial invention of first colonialism and then oppositional movements. Um, no, because a widely shared design practice doesn't necessarily give you a, a, a unity of culture, and it definitely is not in the DNA. Um, and finally, the fractals have self-similarity. So they're similar to themselves, but they're not necessarily similar to each other. You see very different uses for fractals. It's a shared technology in Africa. And finally, well, isn't this just intuition? It's not really mathematical knowledge. Africans can't possibly really be using fractal geometry, right? It wasn't invented in, in, until the 1970s. Well, it's true that some African fractals um, are, as far as I'm concerned, just pure intuition. So some of these things, you know, I would wander around the streets of Dakar asking people, well, what are the, what's the algorithm? What's the rule for making this? And they'd say, well, you know, we just make it that way because it looks pretty stupid. Uh, but sometimes, sometimes that's not the case. In some cases, uh, there would actually be algorithms and very sophisticated algorithms. So in Mengwetu sculpture, you see this recursive geometry. In uh, Ethiopian crosses, you see this wonderful unfolding of the shape. Um, in uh, Angola, the uh, Chokwe people draw lines in the sand, and it's what German mathematician Euler called a, a, a graph. We now call it an Eulerian path. You can never lift your stylus from the surface, and you can never go over the same line twice. Fences around the world are all Cartesian, all strictly linear. But here in Africa, you've got these nonlinear scaling fences. So I, I tracked down one of the folks who makes these things, this guy in, in uh, Mali just outside of Bamako, and I asked him, how come you're making fractal fences? Because nobody else is. And his answer was very interesting. He said, well, if I lived in the jungle, I would only use the long rows of straw, because they're very quick and they're very cheap. Doesn't take much time, doesn't take much straw. He said, but wind and dust goes through pretty easily. Now, the tight rows up at the very top, they really hold out the wind and dust but it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of straw because they're really, really tight. Now, he said, we know from experience that the farther up from the ground you go, the stronger the wind blows, right? It's just like a cost-benefit analysis. And I measured out the lengths of straw, put it on a log-log plot, got the scaling exponent, and it almost exactly matches the scaling exponent for the relationship between wind speed and height in the wind engineering handbook. So they, these guys are right on target for, for a practical use of, of uh, scaling technology. They got very excited when they saw the Cantor set. And uh, one of them said, you know, come here, I, I think I can help you out here. And so he took me through the initiation ritual for, for a, a, a bum and a priest. Um, and of course, I was only interested in the math, so the whole time he kept shaking his head going, you know, I didn't learn it this way. But I, I had to sleep with uh, a cola nut next to my bed, buried in sand, and give seven coins to seven lepers, and, and so on. Um, and finally, he, he, he revealed the, uh, the truth of the matter. Uh, and it turns out it's a pseudo-random number generator. They're using deterministic chaos. When you have a 4-bit symbol, you then put it together with another one sideways. So even plus odd gives you odd. Odd plus even gives you odd. Even plus even gives you even. Odd plus odd gives you even. So it's addition modulo 2, just like in the parity bit check on your computer. Uh, and then you, you take this symbol and you put it back in, so it's a self-generating diversity of symbols. They're, they're truly using a, a kind of deterministic chaos in doing this. Now, because it's a, a, a binary code, you can actually implement this in hardware. What a fantastic teaching tool that should be uh, in, in African engineering schools. And the, the most interesting thing I found out about it was uh, historical. In the 12th century, Hugo of Santalia brought it from Islamic mystics into Spain. Uh, and there it entered into... Uh, the, 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 uh, the alchemy community as geomancy, the, 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 the divination through the earth. This is a geomantic chart drawn by, uh, uh, for, the, for King Richard II in 1390. Leibniz, the German mathematician, talked about geomancy in his dissertation called De Decombinatoria. And he said, well, instead of using one stroke and two strokes, let's use a one and a zero. And we can count by powers of two. Right? Ones and zeros, the binary code. George Boole took Leibniz's binary code and created Boolean algebra, and John von Neumann took Boolean algebra and created the digital computer. So all these, these little PDAs and, and laptops, every digital circuit in the world, started in Africa. 
And I, I, I know uh, Brian Eno says there's, there's not enough African in computers, but, you know, I don't think there's enough African history in Brian Eno. 